Okay, welcome back to another episode of An Amber A Day, the Functional Nutrition Podcast. I'm your host, Amber Fisher. And today I am here with client and friend, Selene Tomanendal. Hello, Selene. Hi, I'm happy to be here. And we're so excited that she's joining uh, me today because Selene is a client who has PCOS and we did, uh, we worked together on PCOS and fertility and um, we want to share her experience of what that was like working with a functional nutritionist on that kind of stuff. So I know that um, those of you who listen, some of your favorite episodes are when I interview clients. So I'm always trying to see if they will grace us with their presence and come on here and tell us their experience. So Thank you so much for being here, Selene. It really means a lot. And I know there's a lot of people listening that are going to be really excited to hear from you. Um, so Selene, did you tell us a little bit about yourself? What do you do for a living? And, you know, just tell us about you. Okay. Um, well, I am a manager at a pediatric dental office. I love working with kids. Um, I'm dog mom, or I guess pet mom now, because now we have a cat. So I have a cat and two dogs. Um and then soon I've got a few more months and I'll be a baby mom too. So yes. So Selene is, what are you, 21 weeks? 21 weeks today, actually. 21 weeks today, pregnant. So, and still not feeling the best. So she's, she's extra <laughs> nice for coming on today. Yes. She said she threw up her water last night. <laughs> yeah. So fun. <laughs> it's just been a real fun ride. Um, <laughs> Okay, so how long have you been, uh, you and I been working together, Selene? Has it been over a year at this point? I think so. I want to say we started March last year. Okay, so about a year together. And um, of course, we haven't done a ton since you got pregnant, Um, (laughs) but uh, that's good. So when you first came in to see me, kind of catch us up on like, where you were in your life, why did you seek out nutrition? Mm-hmm. So I really was seeking out um, just a way to feel better. I was really sluggish and tired all the time. Um, I had um, packed on all this extra weight from being off and on bed rest for a few years from a car accident. And so just all the years of, you know, physical therapy and all the stuff I was doing pertaining to that um, and being on bed rest, especially really just kind of packed on a lot of weight. And I just couldn't get rid of it um, with PCOS because that just sticks to you. Everything you eat just sticks to you. (laughs) And so I just, I, you know, I tried everything. I tried keto. I tried Weight Watchers. I tried any crazy thing you could think of I tried and you know exercise was hard because of my injury and I was just looking for a way to feel healthy because I didn't feel good I was just tired and I I wanted to feel like myself again yeah yeah I think that's huge I think so many people that's their reason for for coming in it's like not necessarily it's just like this general feeling of like I don't feel good anymore and I want to feel mm-hmm. good again you know and you're just seeking answers and and all that yeah. so um so tell us about what you had tried before so you'd done you'd done keto before because I know a mm-hmm. lot of a lot of women with PCOS do gravitate towards keto what was your mm-hmm. experience of that um I mean keto worked okay for me um I realize now after the food allergy testing that if I had done it a little differently, it might've worked a little better. Um, But even like doing keto, I did lose some weight, not as much weight as I wanted, but I didn't, I still didn't have that feeling of feeling better. Like I didn't have more energy like I do now. Um, I didn't, I didn't feel healthy, but I was losing weight. So I was happy I was losing some weight, but at the same time, like I just, it still didn't feel right. And so we didn't keep up with it. Um, yeah. So <clears throat> there's a couple of things that I would love to touch on with that. Cause I think 
you know, one of the things about PCOS is that it's, it's such a basket diagnosis. So Mm -hmm. there are so many different types of women that are diagnosed with it and they all kind of need different things. Mm -hmm. But when we have insulin resistance, which is really common in PCOS, it's really tempting to kind of go and do, um, to do like keto and keto does work well for a lot of women. So you hear these Mm -hmm. great stories and everything. Um, But I think the deeper perspective with you that was really interesting was that you also had these food sensitivities that were, Mm -hmm. um, that were really contributing to a lot of, not just to the weight and everything, but to how you were feeling, like to your energy levels. Mm -hmm. And the, the, my issue with keto or any other diet that's very specific like that is that it just by nature of how it is, it doesn't have room for individuality unless you Mm kind of take it and modify it yourself. And it's hard to know how to do that. Like, you know, you're just like looking at something and you're like, okay, well, this is how I have to eat. Right. Um, so, um, tell us, I think people will be interested about that. So what were your food sensitivities? Um, well, the big one was dairy, um, which I had kind of guessed about, but yeah. like, even when I was doing keto, like all I was eating was like cheese and bacon, basically. I mean, okay, not really, but like, that was a big part of it. And sure. so like, if, if I had cut the cheese out a lot earlier, I would have been feeling better. A lot oh, like, <laughs> yeah, I think um, the dairy thing is interesting too, because like, keto is tough for me. I I fall so in the middle on it because like Mm -hmm. there are versions of keto, like clean keto that I've heard of, you know, Mm -hmm. that I actually think might be a decent approach for a a lot of women with like serious insulin resistance issues and stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, but that, like that kind of clean deal usually is like also dairy free and gluten free Mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And I think that's an important piece of this too, is that it's very tempting on keto to just get lost in the carbs and like, okay, as long as I stick to this number of carbs, then I'll lose weight. And like you experienced, you did lose weight. And so that's Mm -hmm. gratifying because you feel like, Hey, I must be doing something right because I'm losing Mm -hmm. weight. But then also there's these like subtle inflammation things happening, um, that in my experience with women prevent the weight loss from going as quickly as it could. Mm-hmm. And also eventually kind of catch up to you. So what I've noticed is when someone continues on keto for a while, it's like if they have if they have more than 20 pounds to lose, that some of that weight comes off pretty quick, no matter what mm-hmm. they do, as long as they're kind of cutting, cutting calories, cutting carbs, that type of thing. But eventually, if they've got underlying inflammation from like mm-hmm. maybe food sensitivity, for example, yeah. Um, it really like it starts to really slow down. So I don't know if you experienced that where it was like yeah, you just couldn't budge a little. Yeah. Yeah. I the first 10 pounds was easy to lose. And then I think with keto, maybe I got to 20 at the most, mm-hmm. but I had a good like 60 pounds to lose. And like after that, it just kind of stalled out. And I was just like, well, it's not working anymore. So what are we yeah, doing? Yeah, that's what's so frustrating because you you are you're doing it right. And I think with PCOS, the big frustration is that most of these women that I talk to, they are theoretically doing things right. I mean, yeah, like it's tempting to kind of on any diet to eat too much of the the stuff that's like like on keto. It's tempting to eat too much cheese. It's tempting to eat too much bacon because they're kind of like free on keto, you know, and other diets they would be like really restricted. So you're like, Hey, I can have this and still lose weight. And it's great. And it's the same thing with like, if you're vegan, like it's really tempting to eat a lot of like sugary foods because they can still be vegan, you know? Um, but yeah, I feel like if you find yourself at that space where you are losing, you can lose a little bit. Like I would say probably most people it's, it's around that 20, 30 pound mark and it won't go below that it might be worth looking into whether you have maybe more underlying types of, of inflammation. Mm-hmm. So yeah. when we first got started together, we did an elimination protocol, right? We tested mm-hmm. you and then we did an elimination. So tell us what that was like. It was challenging. <laughs> it, was, it was challenging, but I feel like it was so helpful so quickly that it made it easier to stick with it um because it was definitely I I mentioned dairy 
Um, but there was also like gluten and like anytime I died, I'd do like vanilla shakes because I like vanilla, vanilla was on my list, of course. So like realizing like all these healthy decisions I was trying to make before were all limited by these sensitivities that I didn't even know I had. And so just having that information and being able to make choices based on that made it really easy to just pick another option and kind of go with it. Um, and so, you know, there's always temptation starting out, especially like, so I, I work in a dental office and people are constantly bringing us junk. Like I swear last week um, we had cake, we had donuts, we had cookies. Uh, my doctor went out for Chick-fil-A, like, you know, and so there's always temptation there. And so I just kind of learned to like keep snacks that I can have on hand and make sure, you know, I have what I need to be satisfied and then just find things that are in my, like within my limitations that I really like and, and keep those things on hand. Cause if you have something that you like that you can focus on, it's not like a, like it keeps it from being like a chore or like boring, I guess. Yeah, I think that's a great tip. And like for me, I don't eat eggs because I have an egg sensitivity. Um, and I'm not perfect with it, you know, and I, I want to talk about that progress over perfection. Um, but I have, there's this product called just egg that's like made from mung beans and it has the same texture as eggs. And I, I eat that stuff all the time because I love eggs, but they make me feel like crap. So, you know, yeah. so I eat that instead. And it's like finding things that you like, there are so many substitutions out there mm -hmm. now. And I think when people first start a restrictive diet like this, they feel like they're going to be trapped in just eating chicken and broccoli. But mm -hmm. if you, one suggestion I always make when people first get started is to take a trip to like Whole Foods. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, I don't shop at Whole Foods every time because it's expensive, right? Yeah. But like, it's the mecca of all the cool new stuff that's healthy, right? So you can go there and find brands. You can go there and find things that you might love mm -hmm. that you can then come back once a month for, you know, and then get your other yeah. things at the regular grocery store. So, um, finding things that you like that are good substitutions is really key, especially when it becomes something that has to be done longer term. Mm -hmm. But I want to talk too about the fact that like, you know, I, I remember this vividly that you would send me pictures from mm -hmm. the, they would bring like cookies and stuff and you'd be like, Amber, yeah. what am I going to do? Like, um, <laughs> That temptation is so real. And, and if I remember correctly, like we were really good about staying pretty strict, like the first mm -hmm. couple months. And then after that, we just sort of found like a good balance for you where sometimes, you know, you weren't perfect and mm -hmm. it was okay because you would just like get right back on, on mm -hmm. the wagon. Um, and I, I think that's key to remember as well, because, um, at the time you and, and, uh, and your husband were, were you, were you guys trying to get pregnant or you were like preparing for fertility treatments or what was the deal with that? So I was at the point where I had kind of given up that we were going to be able to have children naturally. I think we were both kind of at that point because we were trying for about seven years at this point to have a baby. And so at this point, like, like I said, at the beginning, I just wanted to feel healthy and I wanted to feel good. And I was getting my body ready for IVF. Um, and so that's, that's how I was mentally at, I was just like, you know, I'm getting my body healthy so that, you know, hopefully it'll take better. Um, and that was just kind of my goal. And so getting pregnant was like, surprise. <laughs> yeah. Hello. I know. I mean, it, it was surprising. Yeah. And that, let's see, at that point you had been working on health and diet for uh, like not terribly long five or six months maybe yeah not maybe terribly not even long. That long yeah I almost feel like it was like four months or so which is yeah, interesting you because right. you know when we talk about folliculogenesis which is the creation and and um ovulation of the like dominant follicle or whatever that eventually becomes the fetus mm -hmm. that process takes about four months mm -hmm. so you know theoretically if you were able to have like a perfect diet for four months you know you could get lots of nutrients in there and you would be more likely to ovulate a good quality egg if you were to mm -hmm. ovulate. And then we know with PCOS, if you can get your insulin better managed partially mm -hmm. through, um, you know, meal timing and protein and also partially through weight loss. Um, yeah. 
then you're more likely to ovulate more regularly. So the combination of that does sometimes end up in, in, um, you know, a successful ovulation that be, that becomes a pregnancy. I, I want to be clear with everybody that like most of the women that I work with, with PCOS, it's not like this thing where like everybody gets pregnant, you know, mm-hmm. like some of that is still up to like chance and, and luck and, and all those other things. Um, but when you take care of yourself, it does leave room for that to happen more easily. And I feel like, you know, and then that's happened to me several times in practice where somebody has been working with me for like, you know, three, four months, and then they get pregnant on their own. And it's like, it's really cool. Um, but you're the one who did all the work, you know, and you didn't have to be perfect to do it. So that's what I kind of want to make clear because I think, I think sometimes people are hesitant to go through with the nutrition piece Mm -hmm. because they're afraid that if they don't do it totally correctly, that like number one, they won't be able to get pregnant naturally or just won't work out. And then they're going to have to go to IVF anyway. And so they think, well, why don't I just go to IVF? Why waste my time on nutrition? but that nutrition really prepares your body, makes your body a healthier place for an embryo, which makes it more likely that even if you do have to do IVF, that like it's more likely to be successful. So I I imagine given the circumstances, the fact that, you know, you're 21 weeks pregnant now, like if you guys had had to go through IVF, you know, it probably would have been a pretty decent chance of success there. So yeah, so that's awesome. Either way, like there's no shame in if you get pregnant naturally, there's no shame. And if you have to go through fertility treatments, it's just sometimes what we have to do with PCOS to get pregnant, you know? Yep. Yeah. And that's so, what I was prepared for. <laughs> yeah, you were, I mean, you were like, that's, that's what we were working on was just to kind of get you ready, which is so smart too. And I want to say that, you know, for, to you and to all of the women that I have worked with in the past who come to see me or another nutritionist, several months before they're planning to go through IVF, like, how did you guys get so smart? I mean, you're so smart. Like that's, that's the key because it's so, so tempting Mm -hmm. to just be like, well, science is so great now. Let's just go full steam ahead with the fertility treatments and just, you know, cross our fingers and, and hope that it works. Um, And you're not off, you're not always encouraged to pursue like your health or anything like that in that kind of area, you know, like the doctors aren't really telling you like, Hey, go on a healthy diet. I mean, maybe they are, but they're not, they're not concerned with that. Like they're concerned with the IVF cycle. So, um, if you have time before you end up going through fertility treatments to work on this stuff, to just kind of give yourself, Hey, six months, we're not going to worry about fertility treatments. We're just going to work on diet who knows what could happen, but I do think that it, it really, really improves your outcomes. And there's, there's research to substantiate that. So, so that was smart. You're a smart cookie. Um, let's see, what else did I want to ask you? So how did you know that, how did you know that you were pregnant? Well, you know, it was really hard because I was not sick at first. It's funny because I'm, I'm still sick now, but at first I was not very sick. And so my big um, tip-offs that finally kind of put it together for me were headaches, which I didn't realize was a common symptom, but I was having headaches like every day. And then what was the other thing? There was one other weird thing. And I, I like, I just remember Googling, like, can you be pregnant if you have headaches and something else? And it, it was on the list and I was like, oh no. <laughs> is this for real? And I I just didn't trust it at all. And uh, I knew I had a pregnancy test at home. And so like I rushed home that day and I was going to wait because I know it's better to test in the morning, but I was like, I can't wait. Like I need to know. (laughs) And so I took the test and it was positive. And it's funny because I texted another one of Amber and I's friends and I was like, um, does this look positive to you? Just making sure. Cause I, you know, it's like a little faint and I'm like, I think it's positive, but, <laughs> and so it was just so random. I know it was, it, it was pretty funny because, you know, and that's one thing about PCOS is if you don't have regular periods, sometimes mm-hmm. 
women do get pregnant and, and they don't realize they're pregnant because like, how would you really know? I mean, a lot of yeah. PCOS symptoms are like hormonal in nature. So they could mm -hmm. be like similar to early pregnancy symptoms. So weren't you were like, what were you like six, seven weeks? Along? I forget how far along you were when you I think it was, uh, it was eight weeks. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. if you had gone through, like, if you knew when you ovulated, you mm -hmm. would have found out like, you know, significantly oh, sooner. Sorry. So it's pretty, it was pretty like, um, I remember when you texted me that and I was just like, what? Like, I couldn't believe it. It was so, it was so exciting too. And we were trying to yeah. figure out like how far along you might be. Mm -hmm. And, and, um, it's really cool. So I'm, I'm really happy for you guys. And this. what do you feel like was the hardest part about what we did together? And what do you feel like made the most difference to how you felt? I think the hardest part at first was, um, keeping track of things, like keeping track of what I was eating and like, like keeping up with that. Cause I, I am not one to eat at like regular times. And, um, I think another big thing was just realizing that I could come to you, even if I had messed up and that you weren't going to judge me and <laughs> for those cupcakes that they would not stop bringing to the office <laughs> so, um, even I remember even flipping up yeah <laughs> so well, even when I was flipping up it didn't stop my progress totally and no. I could get back on and get back on track and that was yeah important. you could I mean it does not require I mean we could see this from just looking around us, right? It doesn't require a perfectly healthy body mm -hmm. to get pregnant. Like it doesn't require perfection with your diet to get pregnant. Mm -hmm. It just is the sweet spot of like, you know, enough nutrients and all that, mm -hmm. that you have a little bit of extra to share, I guess, with, with, with a fetus. Cause you know, when they, once that baby starts growing, <laughs> just takes what he wants. So, yep. and that's something that should be said too, is like, you know, in these kinds of cases where we get, we get pregnant when we're still kind of like, um, you know, we're not completely done with the process yet. Right. Mm -hmm. There's a rebuilding process that happens. And this is true for any woman. There's a rebuilding process that happens after the baby's born. Obviously there's no pressure to start it like right away, but, mm -hmm. um, after, you know, once you're ready again, and there's often rebuilding of nutrients that has to happen because pregnancy can deplete your nutrient resources. Mm -hmm. uh, but the cool thing about, the really cool thing about pregnancy is, um, you know, your body is so smart and that then the baby is so smart and they're able to get what they need, you know, and mm -hmm. you don't have to be perfect, perfect to get there. Um, so I just think it's fascinating. I mean, it's such a, it's really such a miracle when you think about like how all that stuff happens, how all those different signals and hormone signals have to like go together at the perfect time. It's mm -hmm. just too crazy, you know? Um, so, but um, is there any advice that you would give somebody who is maybe thinking about working on their nutrition or like a place that you feel like would be a good place to start? Mm -hmm. Definitely. I feel like, I feel like the big thing about wanting to focus on nutrition, the thing you need to focus on most is just doing it for yourself, like not for a specific goal. I mean, yes, I super wanted to get pregnant and many other things. There are a lot of other things I wanted to, but really just focusing on myself and my body and what I need to function as a person was really the most important thing, I think. Um, because I think a lot of times, especially as like women and like moms and stuff, like we forget to put ourselves first because we have other priorities. We have our jobs, our husbands, our kids, you know, all those types of things. And, and we're the ones that get left behind. And so making one small decision to do something for yourself is really important and it'll change your life. I think that's a great place to end. I don't think I can possibly <laughs> improve on that. 
That's wonderful. I mean, you're absolutely right. So thank you so much, Selene, for talking with us and for giving us all hope and congratulations thank you. on the baby boy. And um, when he is born, maybe I will share a picture with everybody if you're okay with it and show them. Oh, yeah. Look at this baby that's been born. Um, yes. But if those of you who are listening, if you have questions for the podcast, you can email an Amber Day podcast at gmail.com. Um, and there's links below here to all of the different places you can find me. I'm on TikTok, Instagram, and all that stuff. And then one thing I wanted to mention too, before we closed up is that I have a new uh, PCOS specific community. It's a Patreon community um, where there's like weekly meal plans, weekly videos about PCOS topics, ask me anything sessions. And we even go into like case studies of, of different um, people I've worked with in the past, supplement ideas, just all kinds of general stuff that that gets really into PCOS specifically um, that you guys can um, join and be part of to help you learn and grow in your knowledge. Okay, that is all that we're going to do here. We're just going to close it up and goodbye.